So this is uh, lesson number eight for electricity and magnetism. And today we're going to look at another form of the equation for generating electricity, for generating voltage with magnetic fields. It's, it's actually the same concept, but just in another form. And then we'll look at an application of that, how you can turn an electric motor into a generator. And uh, at the beginning here, let's just kind of go over what we've seen so far in this chapter. Started off with permanent magnets and how they have a north end and a south end. And you've got magnetic field coming out of the north end and making its way to the south end. And magnet or um, compasses are little magnets and they will always show you the direction of the magnetic field. The second thing we saw in the chapter was how you could actually make magnetic fields using electricity. We actually saw two forms of that. Um, and then we looked at how you could generate force on moving charges. They could be singular charges or they could be uh, electric currents. We actually had two forms of that, QVB and LIB. And kind of interestingly here, we're going to have two forms of this equation for the idea of Faraday's law of generating some voltage. So that script E is just really a voltage. You could do a capital V if you want. And we have this form already from last day where you have the number of uh, coils of wire. That's the N and then the rate of change in flux, how fast the flux is changing. And the minus sign was just Lenz's law, letting us know which way the current's actually going to flow. And today we're gonna to have like another part to that. So it's gonna come in a pair for another way that you can actually generate some voltage. Um, off the start, I'm actually gonna show you a picture that's not in your notes. You've got a picture that says simplified view and we'll get to that in just a moment, but I wanna show you where that simplified view comes from. And the idea is, it's kind of a thought experiment, really. You don't even have to do it. You could just say that you did it. What if you had a U-shaped piece of wire, like a trombone slide, uh, just sitting there on your page? So this is a piece of metal. And then we're going to bathe it in magnetic field. So somebody's holding a magnet nearby and making sure this whole area's got magnetic field. I I'm just going to have it going into the page. You could have it going either way. So that's caused by some external magnet. And then we're going to, on top of that little trombone slide, that U-shaped conductor, we're going to add another conductor, I'll just have that in purple, that will lie on top. So it makes electrical contact with the U-shaped conductor, but it is able to slide. And then physicists kind of wondered, okay, what happens if I move it around? What if that's the before picture? And you can see right now it is fencing off quite nicely some flux. It looks like if I want to just count it to count X's, I could say, oh yeah, there's four blue X's. Well, what if I start sliding it down the road with some velocity? Now that little pen of area that's capturing some flux is going to go from four X's to six X's. And that, that single loop of wire, I know there's only one loop here, but that single loop of wire is now going to be capturing more X's than it did before. We're going to be moving up to uh, six X's instead of just four. And so there's going to be some voltage induced to try to create a current to try to stop us from adding all of these X's. So we're going to end up generating some new magnetic field, some induced magnetic field, a second magnetic field that would have to be, in this case, dots, trying to cancel out the X's that we're adding. So how do you do that? How do you run a current you know, in that, uh, that single loop conductor here in a way that will generate some dots? So imagine maybe grabbing the wire right here with your right hand and we're going to do that grab like a fist and you want to have your fingers look like these dots so your fingertips on this part of the, the story need to come at you and if you were to do that then you'd have to have your thumb pointing down here to the right so you'll actually have some current flowing in this direction and that's kind of interesting so just this moving bar cutting through that magnetic field is actually generating some some voltage to create that current for it to happen it's kind of like that like that moving bar is like a, a battery. And I guess this end up here would be like the positive end, right? Where current's coming out of it and then going around that gray wire and then going into that, I guess it would be like the negative end of a battery down there at the bottom of that purple bar. Okay, well, let's see if we can figure out an equation for how much voltage you would actually get. Um, we're gonna take our old form, which looks like this. And you might be wondering, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's some things missing. Shouldn't there be a minus sign? Yep. But, but that's right here. We already talked about which way that current's going to go. Or oh, shouldn't there be a capital N? Yeah, but there's only one loop of wire. So if capital N is one, let's just take it out of there. We don't really need it. We don't really need to bother ourselves with that minus sign either if we're just going to be looking at how big this voltage is. We already know which way that current's going to be going. 
So let's see if we can figure out how much flux there actually is going to be that's changing. Okay, so in this story, the magnetic field is nice and stable. We're not changing its size, but we are increasing some area. We actually have a change in area that's happening here, and that change in area is actually this section of area right there. As that bar moves, we gain some new area. It's like a little rectangle, right, and it's got a length and a width to it. So let's, let's talk about, you know, how big that, that little gain of area would be as being L. So I'm going to call L the size of the bar as you go across the page. Now if X is how far you've walked down the road, then the calculus people would say, oh, okay, well then that extra little walk would be a delta X. All right? That's like a DX, as the calculus people would say. That's the growth in the X that's happening. All right, so that change in area, that little light blue area, would actually be just length times width. It would be the L multiplied by the delta X. So I could actually, I could depict it like this. And so the key thing, though, is this really just comes from this old equation, you know, negative, capital N, change in flux over time, and it's slowly evolving into a slightly new form. And at this point, this is where the calculus people can help us out. This change in X over change in time, if you think about the units to that, it would be like the new meters that you move down the road over the new seconds of the day, meters per second, that's actually velocity. So it's actually just how fast the bar is cutting across all of those axes. So we've now got a new version of this equation for generating voltage, right? It's the old one that's negative N, change in flux over change in time, and it's now turned into this one, this BLV, which is a, a great equation to use if all you have is just a bar that's slicing across some magnetic field. Um, now, a couple little pointers here, uh, and again, we're going to put some notes in in a second, but that entire created voltage turns out is just created by the moving bar. It's not created by the, the gray U-shaped conductor. It's actually the moving bar that's doing it. Um, the bar has to cut across those X's though. If you move that purple bar in a direction where it doesn't cut across the X's, then you won't generate any voltage at all. Now I want to go back just before we get to your page of notes and just talk about um, uh, just which way this current is going back here. When we said the current's going this way, if you were to think of this purple bar as being like a battery, then I guess if it's a battery, this end up here is the positive end because we've actually got current coming out of it going this way. Another way to realize that that end of the bar is going to be positive is imagine you're Benjamin Franklin who thought that maybe the, the actual charge carriers for electricity were positives. I know we have learned that actually it's the electrons that move. But let's just think about a positive here that's stuck on that purple bar. Let's pretend that that positive charge, that proton, is mobile. When you move it off to the right, if you go and do F is equal to QV crossed with B, if you make your thumb point to the right, well, your pointing finger goes into the page for those magnetic field X's, you'll see that your force finger does actually point this way, saying, oh, positives would get shoved up to that end of the purple bar. Okay. We now know that electricity is the other way. It would actually be electrons getting forced that way. But it, mathematically, that's kind of the same thing. So that's one way to see which way of the, which end of that bar is actually going to be positive. Okay, well, you've got this simplified view. We don't need all of this kind of U-shaped conductor trombone slide. Let's simplify it like you've got in your notes. Oh, I should say that when you're doing some homework and your text talks about figure 21-12, that's this picture here with the trombone slide. So if you're sitting there going, well, I don't have this figure, I don't have this picture, uh, yeah, you do. It's, it's that idea of the trombone slide. Okay, this is what you have. So uh, what have we got here? Um, if you have a bar slicing across some magnetic field, then you're going to be creating some voltage. So this equation, BLV, it actually mathematically is the same thing as this one. Negative N change in flux all over change in time. Uh, they're exactly the same thing. They're just, they're just two different things you can use depending on what you see. If you look at a story and you can clearly see a coil of wire, then maybe I'd use that one that I have there in black. 
But if you look at a picture and you see just a single bar slicing across some magnetic field, then it might be better to go with BLV. Uh, there, it turns out, if you're careful, you can actually use either one in any story. Uh, but it's just that sometimes one equation will lead itself to a simpler solution. So this is the story about a voltage from a bar that's cutting across a magnetic field. Now, you have to be careful about which way you move that bar. The way we're moving it here, it will work great. But as you've got on this page of your notes, there are two ways that you could move the bar that won't generate any electricity at all. If you move the bar in those two directions, it won't actually be cutting across the magnetic field lines and you won't generate any voltage at all. It has to cut across that magnetic field, okay? That's the only way, it has to be crossing it like a cross product. Uh, that's the only way that we can generate some voltage. All right, um, now some pictures that are not in your notes, but just some ones that we can talk about. Let's say you're doing a physics question and they say, oh, there's this room, it's huge, it's five meters across, full of magnetic field, and then there's a three meter bar that's moving across those X's. Hey, uh, definitely cutting across the X's, so it's gonna generate a voltage. But if they say, well, which, which length should you use for BLV, right? When you go to use the L in there, well, I would use the three. It's great that you've got this wide room, but you have to have magnetic field movement and you have to have a bar. And there's, there's only a bar that's three meters long. So I would use three in this story here. Okay, what about this story? What if the magnetic field spans five meters, but the bar is seven? What would you use then? Do you use the seven or do you use the five? And the answer is I would use the five. There are some sections of the bar out here and out here that are just not cutting across any X's. So it wouldn't be appropriate to use the seven there. Okay, getting a little more interesting. What if there are two rails in gray, three meters apart, attached to a light bulb in a room that's five meters across full of magnetic field and you drag a bar that's seven meters across. Which uh, uh, length would you use when you go to find the voltage? Uh, this one's a little, a little trickier. Uh, here I would actually use the three. Uh, it turns out we're only in this story choosing to access this much of the bar's voltage. There is some voltage that's being generated out here and here but you're not choosing to access it. If you could somehow go and move those gray rails out to there, you'd actually notice the light would get brighter uh, because then you'd be grabbing more voltage. But in this story here, you would only be grabbing three meters worth of voltage there. So you'd be putting the three in for the L. Okay, um, this example here, uh, pretty much our only big example of the day. Uh, it's a classic example, probably every single Physics 12 student's seen this example. It's a story about an airplane. It's got a metallic wing, and it, the wingspan is 55 meters wide, and it travels over the North Pole. You could do it over the South Pole too, right? But if you go either over the North Pole or the South Pole, that's where the magnetic field's going directly into the Earth, and so the airplane would be beautifully just mowing through those magnetic field lines. Um, magnetic field's not very strong there, but the plane's going pretty fast, and the question is, how much voltage is there created from wingtip to wingtip? And at first you might be thinking like, really, seriously, that'll make a voltage? And the answer is yeah, yeah, it does, um, but it's not very large. Uh, so there's my airplane and uh, let's put some magnetic field out there. So we're going right over top of one of the magnetic poles of the earth. So we're just mowing the lawn, so to speak. There's lots of magnetic field lines that we're penetrating through. And the bar, the purple bar in this story is basically, you know, the wing right there, right? and it's cutting across all of those X's. And so this, this is a perfect time to use BLV. And you could say, okay, um, it doesn't look like a coil of wire to me, so BLV is the best way to go. Magnetic field, decimal zero, 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 0001. The length, 55 meters from wingtip to wingtip. And I do have to change the speed, the velocity. I'd wanna change that to meters per second. Uh, but that's pretty easy to do. We can just divide by 3.6. And so there's the answer, 1.22 volts. Now I gotta tell you, that's where we're supposed to stop for this example for physics 12, but I wanna go one step further and just kinda look at this a little bit more critically and go, well, would this work? Like, could you use that voltage for anything? You know, could you power like a little, a little iPod shuffle or something like that using this 1.22 volts? And the answer is, well, not very easily. Um, you know, if you were to try to run some wires from wingtip to wingtip through the back doors of the plane, the pilot probably wouldn't be very happy with you. But let's say you did, and you're thinking, well, can I access that voltage now? Um, 
by, by using this experiment here. The trouble is, not only does the wing tip, uh, sorry, the, the wing itself, from wing tip to wing tip, generate a voltage, but so does this wire that you've actually extended like this. And it turns out the way this is wired, those two voltages would actually cancel. And so that's a little disappointing. And you might think, oh, this example will never work then. Why are we doing it? Well, maybe, maybe you could find some creative way of shielding one of those wires so that only the wing perhaps generates some voltage. Okay, sure. Yeah, you could do that and you'll generate some voltage. But here's the thing. If you were to then run that little device that you've got, trying to power it by the airplane's movement here, as soon as you did, you would have current that flows this way in the story. It would flow this way through this wire. Not too worried about that because it's shielded, so we've said. But you'd also have this wire right here with some current in it, this wingtip. And that's going to be a problem for us. Because if that, if that wing has that current flowing in it, you know, like, like this, then all of a sudden there's a new part to this story. Now you have uh, a chunk of wire, a length of wire with current in it in a magnetic field. And the next equation that would come into play would actually be F equals LIB. And what would happen is there would actually be a force backwards on that wire, on the wing and it would tend to slow the airplane down. Now, if it's just a tiny little iPod shuffle, the pilot might not notice it, but if everybody in the plane wanted to do that, that'd be a problem. So I guess the moral of the story is you can't get something for, for nothing here. You can't get this energy for free, and uh, you'd have to you know, put a little more fuel into the airplane's engines in order to keep this airplane moving down the road if you wanted to tap into that voltage and draw some current. Um, but we're supposed to just say, oh, it's a VLV story, beautiful, great, and come up with a 1.22 volts. But I wanted to spend a second there and just look at that a little more critically. Last, uh, last page of the day here. We saw back earlier in the chapter, you don't have to draw this out because you've, you've got this earlier in your notes. We saw how electric motors work. And what was actually happening for electric motors is there was a section of wire here in the coil and another section of wire there. They were lengths of wire that had current in them, and they were in a magnetic field, and therefore there was a force on them. And that's what created this torque trying to twist that motor around, right? Some beautiful torque there. Um, and that's great. But what's neat is if I take the exact same device, I don't have to change a thing except take the battery off the end and attach a light bulb. I can use that exact same device and now create an electric, an electric generator, something that will make some voltage. So that would look like this. It's the same device, but here's what you'll want to add to the picture. Uh, you'd have to now physically turn it. So you take your hand, you, you grab a little handle on it maybe, and you start spinning that thing around by hand very fast. And as you spin it around by hand very fast, what will happen is these little lengths of wire here and here, well, that's a perfect little BLV story. You've actually got, in this case here, some length of wire in a magnetic field spinning with some velocity. So each one of those little purple segments would generate some voltage. And you can make that voltage better by increasing your magnetic field, right? Just going with stronger magnets, lengthening the wire, or doing whatever you need to to increase the velocity. So you can turn it faster, or maybe even make the coil wider, then the edges would spin faster too. So for Physics 12, we're supposed to look at this story and say, oh, okay, hey, um, a motor just operated in reverse, where you spin it with mechanical energy going in, will generate electrical energy coming out. And we're supposed to just walk away at that point, just knowing that that works. But I want to go one step further and show you an equation that I'm, I'm not supposed to show you. Um, but it's actually, it's actually kind of cool because it's got all of the issues packed in it. So here's the equation that talks about how much voltage you would actually generate from a generator. And it's got four issues in there. And let's see if we can figure out why all of those issues are actually there. So capital N. Yeah, if instead of having just one wire, if you were to put like multiple coils of wire, then every one of those coils will actually generate some voltage. So yeah, let's go with more and more coils. The area is the A. Okay, so if you were to increase the area of this, 
coil in there, then that not only lengthens the wire that's cutting across the magnetic field, but it makes the edges spin faster. So, yep, better area is good. Stronger magnets, that's the B. And then this, this thing that looks like a W, it's actually a Greek letter omega. We often use that in science to talk about how fast things are spinning, and it's measured in radians per second. Um, so a key thing to notice is that with that omega there, faster spins are going to give you more voltage. Now, th there's the equation that actually tells you the peak voltage as you're spinning this thing around. Um, but I want to now take that idea and just kind of simplify it a little bit right, for what we're going to do next day. And we'll say this. Okay, This is the last little page of notes you've got. For an electric motor, when you take that device and put electrical energy in, then you have an LIB story. You're going to generate some force, and those forces on those edges of the coil will generate some torque. And so you get that mechanical twisting energy coming out. For a generator, it's going to be in reverse, where we actually put mechanical energy in, and then you get this voltage. It's okay to use a capital V there if you prefer, instead of that script E. Uh, you'll get a voltage out if you have those BLVs happening, okay, those lengths of wire spinning with nice velocity. Some key things to know for next day. The faster the generator spins, the larger the voltage. So yes, there's the equation that I'm not supposed to show you, but the key thing about that equation is this spin rate. Right? So if you spin it with no speed at all, speed zero, if it's stopped, you get no voltage. But if it's spinning, you get a voltage. And the faster you spin it, the larger the voltage that you'll have. And that's going to be the end uh, for today. And next day, we'll look and see how that idea of the, the motor and the generator being the same device, how they, that issue can kind of play off itself um, when we look at something called back EMF and counter torque. But for now, this is where we're going to stop for, uh, for today's video.